on December 26, 2004, one of the deadliest natural disasters in human history occurred when a massive undersea earthquake, estimated between 9.1 and 9.3 on the Richter scale, triggered a devastating tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Also known as the 2004 Boxing Day Tsunami, it is estimated that the Indian Ocean tsunami claimed the lives of around 230,000 people, with casualties spanning 14 countries. The tsunami's devastation displaced close to 2 million people within several communities, leading to the destruction of infrastructure, roads, bridges, and buildings. It is deemed the deadliest tsunami in human history. The waves of the tsunami reached the coasts of Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, Thailand, the Maldives, and Somalia, and affected many other nations in the surrounding region. Of the countries affected by the tsunami, Indonesia was affected the most, with over 160,000 people losing their lives in the country alone. Along with Indonesia, Sri Lanka and India were particularly hard hit, with over 35,000 people losing their lives in Sri Lanka and around 16,000 deaths in India. Like the aftermath of many natural disasters, questions arose on the importance of disaster preparedness early warning systems, and international cooperation. Questions that we are still answering to this very day. Before the 2004 tsunami, the Indian Ocean region, particularly the coastal areas of Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia, were well known for tourism, including beach vacations, snorkeling, and cultural exploration. Places such as Phuket, Koh Phi Phi, and Gaul were among the top destinations for tourists all over the world. Its beautiful coastline boasted magnificent scenery that made it a traveler's dream. Yet, beneath this idyllic surface lay deep vulnerabilities. The most affected region by the tsunami was Ate, Indonesia, a province on the northwest end of the island of Sumatra that was in long-standing conflict with the central government in Jakarta. The exploitation of its natural resources, cultural and religious differences, and the right to autonomy were among the primary reasons for the disputes. This included vast coffee plantations, a key resource that contributed to the country's global standing, yet fueled local tensions. For many living on the coasts of the affected regions, fishermen, shopkeepers, farmers, and those in the hospitality industry, largely revolved their livelihoods around the sea. Little were officials able to predict that this part of the Indian Ocean was under a massive fault line and therefore susceptible to catastrophic disaster. Crucially, there were no existing tsunami warning systems prior to the disaster. On December 26, 2004, the residents of this region were met with one of the most unimaginable natural disasters in human history. A Japanese word meaning harbor wave. In simple terms, a tsunami is a series of unusually large waves that are typically caused by an event on the ocean floor, such as an earthquake. Other causes of tsunamis can be volcanic eruptions, landslides, and even underwater explosions. While often mistakenly called tidal waves, tsunamis are fundamentally different. Unlike tides, which are influenced by lunar gravity, Tsunamis are generated by sudden, massive displacements of water from ocean floor events, allowing them to move far inland. In the open ocean, a tsunami might pass unnoticed by ships, traveling at speeds between 300 and 500 miles per hour, with very little height. However, as these waves enter shallower coastal waters, their speed dramatically decreases, but their height rapidly builds. The waves can reach up to 100 feet above sea level, transforming into towering walls of water that crash onto land. Unlike a single rogue wave, a tsunami is a series of powerful surges, often with the second or third wave being the largest, hitting minutes or even hours apart, causing widespread flooding and large-scale destruction. It all started with a roughly 9.2 magnitude earthquake, striking the west coast of Sumatra, Indonesia. Known as the Sumatra Andaman earthquake, it is considered to be one of the most powerful ever recorded. Categorized as a megathrust earthquake, it happened when two tectonic plates converged, with one being subducted or slid beneath the other. The Indian Ocean Basin sits on top of a very seismically active network of tectonic plates, the most significant of which being the Sunda megathrust. 
This is where the Indian plate slides under the Burma plate. Over time, the pressure buildup along these fault lines eventually causes a sudden, catastrophic release of that pressure, leading to what is known as a megathrust earthquake, the most powerful of seismic events at a subduction zone, capable of generating magnitudes of 9 or higher on the Richter scale. Despite the lack of an effective tsunami warning system, it was reported that much of the wildlife in the area were behaving bizarrely, moments before the waves reached the coast. Since animals have heightened senses, such as hearing and smell, they were able to detect the earthquake's activity much before the region's inhabitants were able to. Among the strange behavior were birds flying further inland, away from the coasts, and dogs avoiding the beach. While on a beach in Phuket, Thailand, a 10-year-old from England was able to notify her parents that a tsunami was on the way after learning about the warning signs just two weeks before the disaster. After initial doubt about the young student's prediction, her parents were able to convince local staff of a pending tsunami, leading to the evacuation of the beach. The warning saved the lives of over 100 people, with no deaths being reported. Those on the beach narrowly escaped the effects of the tsunami. Unfortunately for millions of others, with the absence of an effective warning system in place, the earthquake and tsunami came as a complete surprise. On the morning of December 26, 2004, the earthquake struck the coast of Sumatra right before 8 a.m. It would last for almost 10 minutes, making it one of the longest lasting earthquakes ever recorded. The subduction of the Burma and Indian tectonic plates caused a rupture of over 1,200 kilometers, or roughly 750 miles, along the sea floor. While the earthquake was felt by many, after its end, there was no longer a perceived sense of danger. While some coastal areas were immediately engulfed within minutes, others felt the tsunami's impact hours later, as the waves traversed the vast ocean. Within 30 minutes of the earthquake, the first waves of the tsunami hit northern Sumatra. Within another hour, the waves reached Thailand and then reached Sri Lanka after another hour. The coast of Sumatra, particularly the western coast near Aceh, was the first region affected by the earthquake and tsunami, as it was the earthquake's epicenter, where the first tsunami waves radiated from. The Aceh region of Sumatra was where the highest number of casualties occurred, with estimates ranging all the way from 160,000 to 220,000 deaths. The next hardest hit nation was Sri Lanka, where over 30,000 people lost their lives. India and Thailand suffered over 16,000 and 8,000 deaths respectively. The earthquake and tsunami also managed to cause death in countries as far away as East Africa, including Kenya and Tanzania. Waves were even said to reach all the way to the Middle East. Survivors recall a dramatically receded sea line, exposing previously unseen parts of the seabed. This phenomenon, known as the drawback, tragically drew many curious onlookers closer to the shore, unaware that this exposed seabed was merely the ocean pulling back before unleashing its fury. Tragically for many, this was not recognized as a sign that a tsunami was rapidly approaching. Personal accounts describe the tsunami as incredibly powerful, producing an unprecedented loud and thunderous roar, something akin to that of an explosion. Frequent accounts of the event describe the tsunami as a wall of water, waves reaching nearly 100 feet in height, brown in color, due to the sediment and trees destroyed in their path, came sweeping inland, discriminating against nothing. Survivors witnessed unimaginable horrors. They watched their homes and communities be destroyed in one fell swoop. Many were forced to hold on for hours, clinging onto anything possible in order to survive. Floating debris, trees, and whatever else the churning waters presented. They witnessed people struggling to stay afloat and the tragic loss of life around them. Sadly, some would even lose their entire families in the disaster. Their entire worlds and points of reference were utterly devastated, leading to shock 
and confusion. The days, weeks, and months following the disaster were a very somber time, marked by profound mourning and a global outpouring of solidarity. Following the earthquake and tsunami, an estimated 230,000 people lost their lives, with other estimates being upwards of 250,000. In addition to the loss of life, millions of inhabitants in the area were displaced. Property damage from the disaster was estimated to be around $13 billion, with half of the costs being sustained in Indonesia alone. Following the earthquake and tsunami, numerous expatriates, humanitarian organizations, and governments swiftly came to the aid of those affected by the event, with the United Nations being heavily entrusted with the massive relief efforts. Immediate tasks, such as burying bodies and feeding the approximately 1.7 million people displaced from the tsunami, were among the top priorities. While a large host of relief agencies were able to arrive in the affected regions, many appeared with undefined roles or lacked any connections with the already fatigued locals. The chaotic influx was even dubbed by some as the second tsunami of aid agencies, overwhelming local capacities already struggling with immense devastation. At times, the relief effort looked to be in total disarray, as supplies were often poorly distributed due to a lack of planning and damaged infrastructure. The absence of a central authority in many areas led to widespread confusion and inefficiency in coordinating national and international relief aid. While much of the attention was focused on international relief agencies, the local response was equally capable, as local communities were typically the first responders. However, criticism also arose regarding the potential corruption of donated funds discrepancies between pledged and received donations, and the often insufficient amount pledged by wealthier nations. The United Nations was able to raise around 6.25 billion US dollars, with a total of 14 billion dollars raised around the world. This amount donated at the time was unprecedented, as the relief effort of the Indian Ocean tsunami was one of the most well-funded ever. Many of these donations came from the general public in countries across the globe. Yet, many relief agencies received more donations than they knew how to effectively spend, leading to significant operational and coordination struggles. Much of the aid was sometimes inappropriate for the tsunami survivors. Often, aid would include items like expired medicines, winter clothes sent to tropical regions, and culturally unacceptable foods, such as pork, in areas largely home to Muslim communities. The 2004 earthquake was not the first seismic activity experienced in the region. Just four years earlier, on June 4, 2000, an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.9 occurred near Angano Island, just off the coast of Sumatra, causing significant damage. Despite this history, Unlike the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean lacked a comprehensive tsunami warning system, a crucial omission which critics believe may have saved countless lives. Officials had not considered the potential of an earthquake of such immense magnitude occurring in the region due to several prevailing scientific beliefs at the time. First, they considered the age of the subducting plate. It was widely thought that only geologically young subducting plates could generate an earthquake of such immense magnitude. Secondly, officials believed that the convergence of the plates would be too slow to produce such a large earthquake. And lastly, they incorrectly believed that earthquakes of this magnitude only occurred in regions without back arc basins, geological features found at convergent plate boundaries that are characteristic of the Pacific Ocean. However, the Indian Ocean does have these basins, leading to a critical scientific oversight. These misconceptions collectively created a dangerous blind spot, leading scientists and officials to severely underestimate the seismic risk in the Indian Ocean. There was simply no system in place to detect the colossal undersea shift or to alert coastal populations who were living unknowingly on the edge of such immense geological power. 
the few natural warnings, like the strange animal behavior or the sharp observations of a 10-year-old, were tragically isolated and not fully able to warn against the overwhelming surprise that struck on December 26, 2004. That one day in December 2004 has become known as one of the deadliest in modern history. The earthquake is considered to be the most powerful ever recorded in Asia and among the top few ever recorded in modern seismology. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami also caused serious environmental damage. One significant effect was damage to several coral reefs in the ocean. Coral reefs serve as natural barriers and hosts for a rich diversity of marine life. Damage to these vital organisms can impact the availability of fish and leave a coastline susceptible to future natural disasters. Beyond coral reefs, vast stretches of vital mangrove forests were also obliterated. These natural coastal defenses, which had provided critical protection against the initial wave in some areas, were swept away, further exposing coastlines and disrupting delicate ecosystems vital for local fishing communities. The massive inland displacement of seawater also led to the widespread contamination of freshwater sources, which caused long-term issues for drinking water and farming. The salination of agricultural land in particular rendered vast areas infertile for years devastating farming livelihoods. Many of the communities in the region affected by the tsunami heavily relied on tourism or fishing, as many of these vital industries and destinations were destroyed. Recovery to pre-tsunami levels took years, with some locations never truly recovering their former vibrancy. The economic and social scars lingered, shaping the future of these coastal societies. The Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning System was established just one month later but would not be operational until June of 2006. Its goal is to notify residents in areas around the Indian Ocean of the potential danger of approaching tsunamis, providing crucial days, hours, or even minutes for evacuation. Just two months after the tsunami, in February 2005, the Tsunami Evaluation Coalition was created with the goal of evaluating the relief and response efforts in the wake of the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. The four main findings from the evaluation effort dealt with local capacities, international support for local actors, the quality of interventions, and the unpredictable funding system. Since then, warning systems have been significantly improved, not only in the Indian Ocean, but across the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans as well. These systems now integrate advanced seismic sensors, deep ocean buoys, and rapid communication networks. Importantly, Efforts have also focused on educating coastal communities about tsunami warning signs and evacuation procedures, empowering them to respond effectively should disaster strike again. Over 20 years later, the effects of the tsunami are still profoundly felt today. Some regions are still continuing to develop economically and put in place the infrastructure that would protect against any future tsunamis. Buildings, roads and bridges are still being rebuilt, along with the coastal ecosystems that serve as a buffer. Survivors are still grappling with post-traumatic stress and other mental health challenges, including survivor's guilt, as they continue to remember the loved ones lost in the disaster. The Indian Ocean tsunami stands today as a dark lesson in disaster preparedness, disaster relief and the countless lives that could be saved if adequate precautions are taken. The global community has made and continues to make significant efforts to ensure a disaster of this scale and with such devastating surprise will never happen again.